So that was a little bit about objects. Another major, major area we've done tons of improvements on uh, that I hope you really can feel in Battlefield 3 is the, is the lighting. So this is a pretty interesting screenshot in an indoor environment. This is something we've never had in any Battlefield game before. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of all the stuff we've done here. So just going through a little bit and categorize what, what, what we have in the scene. So here's just a point light from this fire. The fire is just lighting up the environments, which looks pretty cool. Uh, some effects in there, a burning car, I think it is. Here's just a standard spotlight of a car being lit by a spotlight in this parking garage. And here you see the specular highlights between, from cars and from the, from the point lights in the scene. And here we also have some, some classic lens flares uh, of just doing their thing there. Um, and also some emissive particles that are sort of uh, being lit up, uh, lighting up the environment a tiny bit uh, thanks to the bloom. So this creates a quite interesting overall picture with a lot of detail in and a lot of dynamic. And all of these light sources are dynamic in this scene. So stuff can move around, stuff can explode, uh, or the shooting, the muscle flashes. So we spend a lot of effort on, on improving lighting. And I'll go into more different types of steps that we have here. Here we also have a shot of the lighting. But this is a much more much different uh, screenshot. This is a screenshot on, on, in an outdoor environment on the same level you saw, uh, uh, saw earlier with, um, with all the draw calls on. Uh, but here we only have a single, single big visible light source here, which is the sun. Um, and this is actually quite di the difficult to light these scenes properly, because the sun is so bright, and there's areas that are so very dark in the scene. So what you, we need here is, is, uh, really some, uh, is to have a really proper HDR rendering of the scene that captures all the different intensities of the light sources that we have, even though if it's just a single sunlight and, and a sky. So we, we render everything in FP16, which is an HDR format on the GPUs. And then we can uh, take a look at that picture and estimate what the exposure should be for it to get a good view of, of make sure the darks are not too dark and the brights are not too bright, and really adapt to different environments there. Um, <laughs> and the key part of uh, this HDR rendering is also Bloom. Because Bloom, back in the day, was just a cheap filter that someone added on top of the screen in order to make it yeah, I don't know, or to make it look pretty crap, actually. But uh, nowadays, uh, and the way we implement Bloom here is that Bloom is a natural part of an HDR rendering pipeline, because Bloom is what happens when you have something that's brighter than one. Then you need to show that somehow. And the, the, the way the human eye works and the way a camera works is that if something is, is brighter than the max brightness you can have, then it bleeds over to the rest of the scene. So Bloom is really an essential part of this. You see a little bit here on this screenshot, but I have some other examples here also. Uh, here's a screenshot without no, with no bloom. Uh, it looks pretty okay, but you see this kind of harsh uh, edge there that makes the picture look kind of weird and unnatural. And then if we add some bloom on that, uh, without really destroying the gameplay or anything like that, it just uh, improves the picture overall. It makes it a, smoothing, a smoother and um, better picture that fits in better in the environment. Um, okay, so let's go into some more tech details on how actually uh, lighting is implemented. Uh, this is a little bit more complex, but uh, the, the, way our, uh, the way our entire rendering pipeline in the engine works is that we use a scheme called deferred shading, uh, compared, uh, which is uh, quite different from the more traditional rendering methods that most games use. There, there, are quite a, there are a few other games that use deferred shading also, like um, Killzone on, on uh, consoles, for example, uh, and a few that use a little bit of hybrid schemes. But most games still use forward rendering, and that's what we've been using before with, in Frostbite and our previous games uh, as well. But the difference with deferred shading is that instead of rendering all the objects just directly and then have the final picture directly that you then just do some post-processing on, uh, instead with deferred shading, what you do is that we render all the objects, but we render them uh, not with the final lighting. We render them to a, what's called a, a G-buffer, uh, which I'll uh, show just uh, in, in a second here. A and then we take that buffer and light, that, light it. So you really separate the object rendering from, from the lighting, which is a major, a major benefit in our case as we want a lot of different types of lighting environments. So it enables us to have hundreds of really large or really large dynamic light sources on our levels. And we can also have destructible light sources and animating light sources. And the cost of the lighting in the scene is, is more dependent on the number of pixels the light source covers instead of the number of objects it covers. So we can have a highly flexible lighting scheme here. Uh, a drawback, though, is that it requires a lot of memory, a lot of GPU memory and a lot of memory bandwidth. Um, so running 1080p with 4x MSA can take up to 160 megs of, uh, well, this, just this single buffer can be 160 megs of memory, which is kind of prohibitive. And especially the memory bandwidth of trying to render that at 60 FPS uh, can be quite heavy. But we'll talk a little bit more about performance later. So here's, here's how that G buffer looks like when, when we're using deferred shading. So when we're, when we're rendering all our objects, 
this is really what we're rendering out. Then we're not rendering out the final picture. We're rendering out a bunch of multiple uh, type of textures that contain different components. Uh, contain the diffuse color of the surface, which is like the col the standard color. Contains a specular scaling factor for that, uh, as well as a smoothness value, which is uh, sort of how how strong the specularity is on, on, on that surface. And we also render out normals that we use for for the lighting uh, later on. And this is really a, qu quite of a different scheme to render. I don't know of that many PC games that do it uh, uh, as uh, fully as we do, but we, we found it to be a really interesting method and that it hel helps us quite tremendously to uh, achieve very different types of lighting environments. And to go into even more uh, lower detail tech uh, on how we use this, that we, when just doing some experimentations with the uh, deferred shading, we found that uh, with the new DX11 GPUs, found pretty early that we could use uh, compute shaders there. Uh, which is a way of not using the graphics rendering pile on a GPU, but just using us as a general super parallel processor, pretty much. We found a method uh, uh, that we developed uh, uh, that we call using tile-based lighting, where we can use a compute shader, which is pretty much just a program you run that runs on the GPU and goes through every pixels, and it can do a lot of, a lot of better light calling uh, to remove how many light sources affect each pixel, and as such, uh, more efficiently uh, light that. So we we save a lot of memory bandwidth there, because that was one of the things I mentioned was a bit of a problem with deferred shading, is that you have this pretty fat G buffer of 160 megs with uh, full quality, and you have to read in that and, and uh, read in that and process that at, on every single pixel when you light uh, stuff otherwise. But uh, with this compute shader-based approach, uh, we improve performance quite significantly, especially when using MSA when you have these really large buffers. So this is something that's only available in Frostbite 2 when using DX11. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty cool benefit uh, that we're working on. Uh, if you use DX10, it still runs more, using more traditional methods. It's just a bit, it's just a bit slower, especially when using MSA. But it still runs and looks the same. Here's a, a, a screenshot from Operation Metro that I think a lot of you guys have played uh, in the beta. This is an indoor environment, of course, in, in sort of the cave uh, subway section here. And this is the final picture it looks like. I just wanted to show the importance of lighting in this picture. So this is the final picture that you see on screen. And this is how the lighting looks in this scene. So it's Really, most of the detail you're getting are actually coming from the lighting, uh, which is really quite remarkable about how efficient it is here. So it's the lighting combined with the normal maps on the surface, the normal maps that were rendered into the, into the G-buffer that sort of contribute tremendously to this picture. Another example, also from um, Operation Metro, is uh, further out on the, on, on the actual subway here. Here we have the pure diffuse lighting that we're rendering out. We have a whole bunch of different types of light sources. We up on, up on, the, on the roof there, we have... Uh, uh, line lights, which is sort of these long cylindrical light sources that are lighting up the environment. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility on what type of light sources we can use. And you also see that there's, like, there's almost like there's light everywhere a little bit in the scene. And that's our, our radiosity solution that's been calculated to uh, bounce around this light in the environment here to light up everything so it sort of fits together, um, which looks really quite nice. So this is the, the diffuse lighting. We also have a specular lighting pass. Uh, that's done at the same time of, of calculating the more direct reflection of, of, of lights, which is used by a couple of multiple methods here. Uh, some light sources uh, affect the specular, some don't, and we have environment maps and we have multiple methods. So th this diffuse and the specular are really rendered at the same time and, and then combined to a single final picture where you both have the diffuse lighting, you have the specular lighting, and you have the, the colors and everything from, from, from the G-buffer as well to get this final picture, um, which looks really quite interesting. Another very important uh, component there, I mentioned a little bit about the radiosity, uh, we also call it indirect lighting, uh, is that uh, it adds a lot. Uh, the right screenshot you have, uh, uh, this is part of Operation Firestorm, that's uh, an area where we disable the indirect lighting, our radiosity calculation. This is sort of what we had in, in Bank Company 2. You can make great games without having uh, bounce lighting and having not too fancy shadings there, but uh, if you tweak it properly and you really have talented artists, but uh, the, the left screenshot with actually indirect lighting, the radiosity calculation we've done, adds so much more, so much visual, more visual fidelity and sort of a, a softness of the lighting in this environment that we really, really like. Um, this is another screenshot from that level that really shows the difference. Uh, of, you have surfaces here, some portions of this, uh, this scene that are almost completely dark uh, without the indirect lighting, but when, when we add that, they can be just as bright as they are on the, uh, on the sunny side of the building because the, the sunlight has bounced around in this building here. Uh, and the final thing about lighting, we also have uh, spotlight shadows. We're able to have multiple types of light sources, spotlights and line lights and point lights. And our spotlights, they can have uh, shadows for quite a dramatic effect in multiple areas.